Okay, hi everybody. Today we are going to talk about information that guides assessment in speech-language pathology and assessment across disorder categories and really across the age range. <coughs> Excuse me. And those sources of information, if I can click properly here, are paradigms. Paradigms uh, of language. The term paradigm uh, refers to uh, really theoretic perspectives. That's uh, the theory is a uh, synonym, more or less, of the term paradigm. And uh, there are multiple points of view or theoretical perspectives on what language is, and each reveals different. Uh, each theoretic perspective, theoretic perspectives reveal aspects or components of speech and language. So um, multiple theoretic perspectives open up to us multiple components of language that need to be considered in the course of assessment of any speech-language problem or suspected speech-language problem. Now the four paradigms we're going to look at today, and there are many of them out there, the four that we're going to look at today are the developmental relational paradigm of Bloom and Leahy, the nativist relational paradigm of uh, Chomsky, information processing point of view on language, and I associate uh, one of the persons uh, who proposed this is Osher, and uh, that's the name I'm referring to here, and the uh, behavioral or operant model of language, uh, whose proponents are Skinner, you have Skinner, everybody's familiar with Skinner, and Lovas, Ivor Lovas, I'm sure many of you are familiar with uh, Lovas's work in the area of autistic spectrum disorder and applied behavior analysis. We'll start with the uh, Bloom and Leahy point of view, which I know is so familiar to everybody here. Um, what is language according to Bloom and Leahy? Well, they reveal to us that language, um, this point of view, reveals to us that language really is comprised of multiple, multiple components interacting with one another. Uh, those components include an uh, a code, uh, a conventional system of arbitrary symbols, ideas about the world represented by that code, and communication, the function of that code. Thus, Bloom and Leahy's conceptualization of language reveals three aspects or interactive subcomponents of language, subsystems of language, content, form, and use. Each are individual and separate on one hand, but they work together in, uh, as a system on the other. And the Bloom and Leahy framework also reveals that not only do we have to be concerned with the components of language in assessment, but we have to recognize that other behavioral systems, behavioral systems outside of language, interact with language to influence, potentially, speech-language production or comprehension. Those behavioral systems are cognition, the sensory motor system, and the psychosocial slash affective system. So those behavioral systems also need to be considered in the course of speech and language assessment. The three systems that are intrinsic to language are content, form, and use. Thus, whenever we produce, or one produces, or, or acts to comprehend language, one is bringing together simultaneously content, ideation, form, the symbol system, and use, the reasons or pragmatics of expression or comprehension. So, uh, and to make matters more complicated, each of these subsystems intrinsic to language, content, form, and use themselves comprise subcomponents. More things to consider in the course of assessment. So content, which refers to a synonym to the term content, is semantics, referring to the ideas 
that are spoken about or understood. We can uh, think about word knowledge, the conceptual and categorical elements of that, and relational knowledge produced typically in sentence production or narrative production, and uh, relational um, aspects of content include object relations um, represented or um, pre, um, expressed through uh, Leahy's uh, content categories such as existence, action, locative action, etc. Categories of ideas individuals speak about, categories of ideas individuals sort specific expressions into, and event relations, also idea categories, but these are more complex categories where two events are related according to time relations, temporal relations, causal relations, if you remember from the Bloom and Leahy model, epistemic or cognitive type relations. And this relational knowledge business involves the, um, really the idea that um, ideas about the world that individuals express or comprehend through language are uh, involved um, a relationship making property of the mind, a universal relationship making property of the mind that influences um, the content, content across languages and cultures universally, so that across cultures, across languages, individuals talk about objects, actions, locations, uh, attributes, states, quantity, um, time relationships, causal relationships, cognitive kinds of relationships, thinking, knowing, etc., communication relationships, etc. Uh, in the area of form, uh, or the, within that, uh, the system of form, we have phonology, morphology, syntax, discourse, uh, which refers to conversation, or narrative. And in all of these cases, we also have a uh, specific behavioral component, but also relational components. And then we have the area of use, also um, comprising subcomponents or subsystems. We have the function of uh, language, which are the reasons, which refers to the reasons for speaking or reasons for paying attention to other people's speech. Uh, and that's the bottom line, bottom line function of language according to Bloom and Leahy express intentionality, express content of mind. Again, this directs us in, in uh, assessment to allow individuals to express intentionality as we assess their uh, language and communication abilities, to express intentionality and for us to evaluate um, their, uh, the intentions of the uh, individual. Use also that area also comprises context sensitivity of language, both linguistic uh, and non-linguistic uh, aspects of the con of context. Linguistic uh, aspects of context involve the way others speak to us, speak to the individual, the linguistic interaction with others, and non-linguistic, the um, tasks, the materials the um, situations that individuals uh, are surrounded by as they speak. And language is quite um, the context sensitivity of the individual. Individual sensitivity to their surroundings influence language performance and leads us to keep in mind um, that uh, we really have to manipulate context in the, in the course of assessment the term actually that we use 
to refer to the manipulation of context and the study of language or assessment of language variation across different contexts is dynamic assessment. Dynamic assessment, which we'll be speaking further about in subsequent sessions. Another aspect of use is contingency, the connections between successive utterances, either produced by an individual or produced in um, interaction with others in, in a conversation, the connection between one individual's utterances and the utterances of another, the ability to maintain topic, shift topic, initiate topic and pragmatic devices that individuals use. The various adjustments in uh, the code, in, in ways of speaking uh, and presenting oneself in different situations. Pragmatic devices, very culturally uh, influenced, typically. Implications for assessment? Well, the Bloom and Leahy model suggests that we leads us to assess language in naturalistic context. It, it uh, leads us to allow clients to direct their own actions, set their own objectives, goals, and express intentionality in, as we assess them. And we, need, we, we are directed to analyze specific utterances according to the linguistic categories and relational organizational characteristics of the utterances. A Bloom and Leahy assessment doesn't give individuals credit for the specifics of their uh, speech and language. For example, if a child says, that's a cat, the child doesn't get credit for knowing cat. That utterance gets categorized according to the uh, type of uh, the type of utterance that it is, and really the the uh, relationship making property of the mind that is accounting for its its uh, expression, so that uh, that's a cat gets categorized as existence, as reflecting the child's or the adult's awareness of existence of an object, or if the individual says the cat is. Um, read, well, the utterance doesn't get credit for, the individual doesn't get credit for knowing that it's a cat or knowing that the color is red, that specific attribute, red, or even color, the individual gets credit for attribution, the category, the relational category that the utterance belongs to. The individual also gets credit for the syntactic category that it belongs to, the syntactic relation, subject-verb complement, single-verb sentence. The person also gets category, uh, um, gets credit for, gets assessed for. The reason, the, uh, the categorical reason for expression, comment on an act, um, on an event, or label an event, not for the specific, perhaps, uh, individual reason for speaking, such as love of, a, of a excitement over a cat, if you're following me. Bloom and Leahy focuses on us on relational, categorical aspects of content, form, and use. Quite specific um, things, aspects, components of language. And that is exactly what theoretical perspectives or paradigms focus us on. Specific aspects of language, uh, speech and language, that need to be considered in the course of assessment. Now let's look at language according to Chomsky, which again, it was a model that, uh, a language model that like the Bloom and Leahy model, I have sub- um, marked as or categorized as relational in nature, and um, you'll see why in a moment. Chomsky, interv interestingly enough, 
Bloom and Leahy refers to language, right, as a code whereby ideas about the world are represented. A code. A code refer, the code refers to the form of language, sp the specific languages that the individual may, or language that the individual may speak. English, Spanish, um, Urdu, whatever. S the specific codes. But Chomsky, Chomsky refers to language as a relationship-making property of the mind. Mind property. What does that mean? Well, it certainly directs us, alerts us, to the fact that in the, co in the course of assessment, we're assessing something that the mind does. We are actually assessing a function of the mind when we assess language, um, analogous to cognition, which is we all, I believe, think about as mind function, reasoning, um, awareness, problem solving, etc. Mind function. Well, language is mind function according to Chomsky. And uh, a, a function of mind that serves as a tool of thought functions to express and comprehend language so that according to Chomsky, there is no expressive and receptive language. There's just plain language. Language, which applies to production in interaction with the sensory motor system and comprehension in interaction with perception. But um, expression and comprehension, production and comprehension, all reflect or a product of that relationship-making property of the mind. And this relationship-making property of the mind has universal characteristics. That is, it, uh, this relationship-making relationship -making applies to any language, any and all languages. Any and all languages. So English, Spanish, French, again, Urdu, Swahili, whatever the language might be. It reflected within it are universal relationship-making property of the mind, which creates structures that express relational meaning. What is relational meaning? Well, it's the things that we just spoke about in the, in the area of Bloom and Leahy. Content categories, existence, action, locative action, etc. Epistemic relationships. And... Uh, those structures, by the way, that express meaning are uh, syntactic structures, lexical and syntactic structures. Not only does uh, the, uh, these, uh, stru these structures express relational meaning, but language determines meaning by analyzing relationships among um, linguistic structures, particularly heads and complements, which we will not deal with right now. Also, Chomsky re reveals to us reveals to us that language is exclusively about mental representations. Language exclusively acts upon mental representations, not real world objects. Now that's an interesting point, isn't it? That um, even when we think about co the content of language, ideation, when we when we are evaluating a client, that client, when the client says, for example, the word table or chair or or floor, these concrete specific things that are right there in front of the client that seem to be objects in the world that the individual is referring to. According to Chomsky, that individual really is referring to the way they're thinking about whatever it is is out there. That is, they have, they're really referring to a mental representation. Is that weird? Well, it's, we just spoke about Bloom and Leahy, and remember their definition of language. Let's re recall that for a moment. Language is a, a code whereby ideas about the world are represented. Ide well, an idea. Where does an idea um, 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 
reside? Where does an idea reside? In the mind. So according to Bloom and Leahy, language refers to ideas or represent the way the world is represented, the way the individual thinks about the world, the individual's content of mind. So both Chomsky and Bloom really believe in this, or, or are referring to this when they talk about language, and particularly the content of language. And we, therefore, in assessment, have uh, this, this alerts us to uh, be evaluating not what's simply around, surrounding the client as they speak, but, all, but try to understand the client's perspective, how the client what the client is representing about the world and what the client is not representing about the world and may need to, that may be a, um, in the course of intervention and that uh, maybe the, what the client may not be representing or representing in a way differently than the uh, convention, the way of doing it, of representing, and that may need to be addressed in the course of intervention. By the way, mental representations don't only refer to ideation or language content. Representation refers to everything about language. Phonology, which is a way of uh, distinguishing among sounds in the world uh, so that we distinguish speech sounds from other kinds of sounds or create them as opposed to other kinds of sounds. Well, that's based on feature representation of one sort or another, right? Distinctive feature representation. And syntax, well, that doesn't exist in the real world. Those are the, that, those are the rules for, for making um, relationships between noun phrase subjects for phrase predicates, uh, relationships in time, and uh, many other kinds of relationships that w as well that create sentences. As, and stories, of course, narratives and, in fact, discourse, conversations, are relationships between multiple utterances. Pragmatics, relationships between individuals and uh, relationships between um, um, uh, speaking and the reasons for speaking, etc. All kinds, all of these things are relational and representational in nature. And uh, Thus, Chomsky and Bloom and Leahy orient us to this relational, representational aspect of language. Implications of Chomsky's paradigm for assessment: access universal relational properties. Assess. I'm sorry. Assess universal relational properties of semantics, syntax, pragmatics, and phonology. Whenever assessing, do not treat reception and production, or reception and uh, expression as two different separate language systems. Instead, try to understand the relational, common relational uh, aspects of content, form, and use accounting for production or reflected in um, language expressed and the individual's um, uh, comprehension of, uh, of, expression, of others' expressions. And uh, the final um, paradigm we're going to look at today, we're going, we'll look at uh, the uh, operant paradigm next time. The final one we'll look at today is uh, the information processing uh, paradigm. Again, I'm relating that to um, David Osher. And uh, language, um, according to the information processing perspective, is um, a non-linear modular behavioral system that, that comprises multiple levels of organization and component processes. Non-linear means these different uh, levels of organization and processes, on one hand, like in the Bloom and Leahy really framework, operate independently of one another. They have their own structure or rule um, uh, or organizational set of organizational characteristics. On the other hand, they interact and um, influence one another. And uh, 
the levels of organization um, that are revealed revealed in information processing theories, and there are a number of these theories, I'm putting them together into one root, one uh, category group that I'm calling information processing theory. And we have uh, multiple levels of organization. They are pre-linguistic or a perception and the sensory motor level of organization, perception referring to determining uh, contrasts uh, uh, between things and uh, linguistic from non-linguistic things, particularly, by the way, um, uh, the, the uh, detection of phonemes, phonemes, which ultimately permit meaning, phoneme distinctions. And the pre-linguistic level of organization is also on the expressive side of things, sensory motor, which uh, is knowing by doing, as opposed to necessarily being conscious of something and providing feedback in the process. Then there's the linguistic level of organization, which we have touched already addressed um, in the area of, by referring to Bloom and Leahy and Chomsky. That is the content form use interaction, the bringing together of ideas the symbol systems for representing ideas, and the pragmatics of uh, function of, uh, of language production or language use. Then there's the metalinguistic level of organization, which involves not simply producing and comprehending language, which involves awareness. The linguistic level of processing involves awareness of the ideas we're speaking about, but nothing else. There's no particular reason, need, need to be aware of phonology, morphology, syntax, etc. unless you're a speech-language pathologist, or you're a child who's in school, or an adult in school, and in a, in a uh, subject area that requires that we think about things like spelling, punctuation, etc., etc., language structure, sentence structure, etc. But babies, by the way, when they start to speak, toddlers, etc., they just start talking. They don't think to themselves, well, pa, you know, m, a, m, e, hey, that's mommy. Uh, or, that's mommy. Hey, I have to produce, put a noun phrase subject together with a uh, verb phrase predicate so that I can say a sentence. No. It just comes out. But I do have to recognize mommy, right? Have that idea, have that rep that mommy represented up here. That's the linguistic level of processing. Meta I say that in contrast to metalinguistics, whereas metalinguistics is the ability to think about language and recognize, by the way, this distinction between what is what is represented uh, linguist uh, by language, the content, the ideas, and the uh, code itself, so that recognizing that um, a cat, the word cat is not the cat. The cat is, or the word dog is not the dog barking behind me, woof woof, the animal, but rather it is uh, a word that uh, stands for that thing that's barking and uh, running around and eating a bone, etc. And that word is created, made up of sound, and it's a part of a sentence, etc., etc. Sound is articulated, blah, 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 all of which is metalinguistics. And um, at, at that meta level of organization, we also can identify um, the information processing a level of executive functions, which is the use of language itself for thinking and problem solving, for regulating behavior. In fact, let's look at executive functions for a few minutes right now because this information processing perspective alerts us to the need to evaluate the possible contributions that each level, one of these levels of function or organization can be uh, making in a case of a speech-language problem. For example, um, a language learning disability can be a function of a perceptual problem, 
distinguishing phonemes, confusing, for example, puzz and buzz. So the kid, the, the teacher says, or a friend says, pat, um, the, your friend on the head, and the kid here is bat, confuses pat with bat, or visual perception involving grapheme distinctions, sees the word pat, but reverses the pun, uh, looks at the word pat, but reverses the pun to a ba, and, and seizes, sees the word as bat, reads it as bat. Pre-linguistic organi um, organization, the perception, or um, th there could be a linguistic uh, component to, um, of course, uh, any language problem, and that's the whole content form use business. There could be a metalinguistic component to a problem, the, the ability to think about or use the feedback from uh, from uh, language production or to um, to reflect on on language itself, and ex the, there could be an executive uh, function issue, which let's take a look at executive functions right now because within the area of information processing, executive functions are uh, very much uh, a focus because they're very much about what goes on in school. And uh, thus they are a uh, target or a uh, always have to be considered an assessment, but they are a target. They are assessed typically through um, norm reference standard published assessments, assessment instruments, executive functions. So let's take a moment and take a look at what are executive functions. Well, executive functions are a set of language-based behaviors used flexibly uh, to guide, a, monitor, and direct the success of one's performance. They're used to manage and direct interactions within the learning environment in order to ensure success. Notice, a set of language-based behaviors to guide, monitor, monitor, and direct one's performance. I'm quoting here, uh, I'm referring here to a, um, Singer and Bashir's work and others. So speech, uh, speech plays a central role in the development of self-control, self-direction, problem-solving, and task performance, according to Vygotsky. And this whole executive function business is very much comes from the work of Vygotsky and other social cognitive theorists. And uh, from this point of view, speech is learned in the course of social interaction and becomes the medium for learning and knowing how to regulate one's own behavior. Children appropriate language as a cultural tool that mediates action. And really what this is referring to is the, the, this use of language referred to initially, by the way, in, in today's uh, conversation, as uh, Chomsky's uh, statement that language a func is primarily a tool of cognition. We talk to ourselves, don't we? We all talk to ourselves. Uh, and according to Vygotsky, children themselves talk to themselves. Adults talk to themselves. And we talk to ourselves um, and we tell ourselves what to do, what not to do, we're, in a sense, always monitoring our actions and um, with reference to self-talk or through self-talk. So according to B Singer and Bashir, executive functions are, um, are, are active in, are developing plans and procedures for accomplishing tasks and problem solving problems. They involve holding plans and action sequences in working memory, retrieving these plans and procedures, using these plans and procedures which are coded linguistically as self-talk to achieve goals and solve problems, and to inhibit irrelevant actions. And incidentally, I, I kind of skipped over the fact that inter, this inter, 
information processing perspective on language that yields executive functions also um, comprises processes that support support language uh, use and these executive functions. Memory processes such as immediate memory, working memory, um, short-term memory, long-term stores, and there are many of them that are identified in the literature of long-term stores. Stores for speech sounds, stores for semantic uh, networks of words and concepts, episodic um, memories for real-life events, etc. So these many, uh, many uh, memory stores, from this point of view, are uh, used to contain these, uh, these um, language, uh, all this language that's ultimately retrieved and used to um, guide problem solving um, and uh, guide a problem solving plan and, uh, and learn some more. Implications for assessment. Well, the information processing point of view leads us to evaluate perception and executive functions as well as linguistic structures in the course of assessment. And to, to um, utilize standard norm referenced assessment, which typically address executive functions, uh, also linguistic structures to some extent, but usually in um, other director or adult directed or clinician directed context, which is important in the course of dynamic assessment. So um, these three points of view that we reviewed so far about language, the Bloom and Leahy perspective, the Chomskyan perspective, and the information processing perspective give us tons of material to consider in the course of assessment of speech and language problems. They open up a whole multiple of variables and um, as we create or construct a mental model for ourselves to apply or to, re to use as a resource in the course of speech language assessment, these paradigms are very much um, valuable in, um, in revealing to us aspects of speech and language that need to be or um, are, are open themselves up for assessment. And in addition to that, I haven't yet gotten to that fourth model. Uh, that fourth model is the operant model, the behavioral model. And uh, we'll hold that for our next session.